When you hear the phrase, soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high-rise buildings, where does the soft part come in and what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. Do you remember where you were on April 20th, 1999? Frankly, I can't, but I know that my guest today does. He was at a high school in Colorado, Columbine High School. I'm not only pleased, but honored and humbled to welcome to the Soft to Steel podcast, Frank DeAngelis. On that day and for three years before and 15 years after, Frank was the principal at Columbine High School. His entire career at Columbine spanned 35 years. Since retiring, he continues to serve society as an education consultant and an author of a vitally important book entitled, They Call Me Mr. D, The Story of Columbine's Heart, Resilience, and Recovery. Frank knows so much about love, inclusion, social justice, and what all this means to leaders in periods of crisis. He shares his experience with audiences across North America and around the world. He is love. He understands with every fiber of his being what inclusion and social justice mean to society, and with his words and actions motivates and inspires us all. Frank, thank you for being with me today. Dennis, it's such an honor to be with you, and uh, my life was truly blessed when you came into it, so this is quite an honor to be with you today. Yeah, and I feel the same way about you. It, didn't, it, it, was, it was pretty easy for me to write a few thoughts to introduce you, and I think uh, you were with us back in February when we had our Softest Steel Summit. You were, you were brilliant. Uh, you were everything I've just described, along with the other folks in that, uh, in that conversation. And it, it's, uh, you know, this, this Softest Steel, as you know, my, my initial, the front rows of my audience with the, is the construction industry. But even including my, my, uh, my producer, Juan, has pointed out to me uh, all the things that, that, that I talk about, things that you talk about, uh, all, it's all about people. It's about people and relationships. It's about living a better life. It's about being of service. Uh, all, you know, all these very fundamental ideas that are the ideas that, if pursued, can make a, a genuine difference one life at a time. And that's the way you've done it. Uh, for all of your working career and since then. So I just want to jump right in and, and just, uh, you know, start with a, with a simple question. What does love mean to you, my friend? What is it all about to you? Love means just caring for people, finding the good in people, and also accepting the bad and just loving them. And, uh, you know, something that resonates in my mind it's all about love and I used to tell my teachers every year when I did my state of the school address I said they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and I live by that premise that the kids need to know if they don't feel loved if they don't feel liked if they don't feel inclusive in the environment they're not going to learn and so that love piece and people actually said Frank were you able to do that at your school? And it, being in a high school, a lot of times they're, they kind of laugh, but I can't tell you the number of times I walked down that hallway, kids would say, love you, Mr. D, and I knew their names and I loved them, and that's important. It's mm -hmm. all about love. What was it, what did it mean before and after? And I'm referring obviously to, to that fateful day in 1999. What did it mean before and after? Well, Dennis, that's really a good question. People asked me what kind of leader I was prior to the Columbine tragedy, and I said the leader I was after. I just, that day did not change me to the point. I, I think the thing that allowed me to stay at Columbine for 15 years after, to be with all those kids that were in the elementary school, is the fact that I had developed relationships. And I was there as a teacher, as a coach, and in three years in my principalship. So it was all about love. And I spoke from the heart. And, you know, I really do owe it to my parents because my parents taught me early on. And I'm so blessed. My parents just celebrated their 69th wedding anniversary. And many of the uh, 
values that I have today, I attribute to my parents. They always said, Frank, you've got to care about people, wear your emotions on your sleeve, stand up for what is right, even though you're standing alone. And even before, I mean, uh, what happened is I just took the skills that I had previously and translated, transferred them over after Columbine, and it helped me to, you know, have some success in that recovery journey. You tell a story about something you used to do, uh, which was write notes to people. Tell us about that. That's the most important thing. Um, one of the things that I did as my first year as a principal, I decided that I was going to write a holiday note, a Christmas note to every staff member. And we had 150 staff members. Now, what that allowed me to do is really find out about the people. And I would go spend time with the building maintenance people, with the cafeteria food service people, with the teachers. And, you know, I went to Catholic school and I have great penmanship, uh, thanks to the nuns. And uh, <laughs> anyone that went to Catholic school. Yeah, there you can, go. I, I know you, need, you, needed, you needed to mention that, didn't you? Yes, Pat? I right. did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, everybody says, boy, you have great penmanship. And talk about, I really have some great values from the nuns that I had in growing up. And, but one of the things that I did is I'm very uh, organized. My wife calls me not only type A, type AAA. So I counted the days uh, right from when Thanksgiving was over to the day right before the holiday break. And I would divide it by the number of staff members. And I would take about five cards a day and write personal notes to everyone. And it was really funny. The first year I did it, people were comparing notes or cards to see if I wrote the same thing. But I did, you know, things such as John, I heard your dad, you know, is in a hospital if you need any time or, geez, I really enjoy or thank you for being at the vocal music concert. And all of a sudden, a little token like that, I didn't realize the importance of it until I'd walk into their classrooms or in their offices, those cards were up on the wall. And it was kind of funny. My first year after retirement, I went to Columbine's graduation and all of a sudden, staff members are coming up and saying, you know, D, what we miss about you. And I'm thinking, my motivational speech is my leadership. They said, no, those <laughs> cards you used to give us. And I said, that's great. You know, it's the uh-huh. little things that make a big difference. And, you know, I and I think back, you know, Dennis, we're about the same age. And I still have notes from people that gave me stuff back in high school or, you know, you save those. And when you have those bad days, which we all do, you bring those notes out and that's what rejuvenates us. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump all over the place. I'm just kind of just as I listen to you, you're inspiring additional questions. You, you, I've heard you talk about uh, about a person's qualities and the importance of how you display those qualities through your words and your actions to build relationships with people. Talk about uh, how you went about building relationships with your staff in the, in, in the school. Uh, you know, w- what did you do? We, we've heard, we, now, we know the story of your notes and obviously that's important, but w- what are the things that you did that, that in your mind, uh, you were saying to yourself, you know, I've got Bob and I've got John and I've got Mary and I've got Tom and I've got 150 people. I need to build a relationship with each of those people. Uh, w- what did you do? How did you do it? One of the things that I did is, um, And I had somewhat of an advantage because prior to becoming principal, you know, I started Columbine in 1979. So a lot of the people on staff uh, I knew from a very early on period of my time at Columbine. And as a matter of fact, it almost hurt me becoming principal because there were uh, supervisors who felt that if I was to be the principal of Columbine High School, that I had certain friends that would take advantage of that situation. And what I found out later is my staff went to the superintendent and others and said, if you don't hire Frank, we're going to let the community know that we're very upset. And we know Mm -hmm. Frank is fair. We know that he will listen to us, but he'll also make decisions. And we have that much faith in him. And so one of the things that was very important that I would call staff members into my office just to chat. And then something else that I did, a lot of times in a large high school, you're departmentalized. You know, for example, you had 20 teachers in the English department, 15 teachers in social studies department, and you end up socializing with those people. But what I would do is I would have something called coffee with the principal or lunch with the principal. And I would mix people from various departments to come together. And we didn't talk about curriculum. We just had conversations and Mm -hmm. we found out about something. And the one thing 
that I didn't do well is I was not an office principal. And there would be staff saying, boy, I come by your office, you're never there. And I said, there's a reason because I want to be with my kids and I want to be in the classroom. And mm -hmm. so I would spend time in the classroom and we'd have these conversations. And I think it's taking time to find out about them. And, and I think that was the most important thing. And it was kind of funny. Um, I can share this. The teachers union came to me in, in my office one day and they were very upset. And I, they said, Frank, I ha we have some concerns. And I said, what's your concern? We can't get anyone to join the union because you treat people so fairly that they said, we don't need to support the union. I said, time out. I said, is that an issue? I said, maybe it's, maybe you need to have me talk to other principals on how to develop relationships as opposed to chastising me because uh, I, need, I don't want to treat people badly. And right. it's not, and I'm sure people are saying, gosh, she was a pushover. No, but if we made decisions and, you know, we would cl have closed doors decisions, but once we, they walked out that door, I knew, they knew I still cared about them and they still cared about me. And I think one of the things that resonated with me the most is my last day, some staff members stood up and said, Frank, you never became one of them. You were always one of us. And we knew you always had our back and you had ours. And so I think I fulfilled that promise to try to put myself in every, you know, each other's shoes because I think that's important. Yeah. You know, I talk about soft skills and I define those as being the qualities, attributes, traits of a person, a manifestation of their personal values. So I put you on the spot and say, you know, off the top of your head, what are what are the two, three or four most important soft skills that you possess? Wow, that's a tough one. You got to think about that. Give me an example, one that you have, and that'll kind of... Me, uh, authenticity. Yeah. Well, that's exactly, I think, number one to me is integrity is so important. Honesty is so important, and what you see is what you get. And I always believe this, and I love this quote, character and integrity is who you are when no one is watching. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important because I've seen leaders stand up and all of a sudden they're given these tremendous speeches and things like that. Then all of a sudden when they're not in front of people, their actions are not the same as their words. And mm -hmm. to me, you know, that that honesty is so important and I'm very upfront with people, but at the same time, caring people, you know, um, I love a quote by it's uh, Winston Churchill. Diplomacy is telling someone to go to hell that they look forward to the trip, yeah. you know, that type of thing. And I actually had people come up to me and say, Frank, you're a person that could tell someone to kiss your backside and they'll thank you for it. It's how yeah. you treat people. And, and I think that's important, you know, uh, caring about people, knowing, you know, and trying to put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I asked uh, someone else, I had a conversation with what, what was the quality they thought was the most important for, for them. Uh, and their answer was kindness. And, uh, and I'm sure that, that you know a tremendous amount about kindness, caring, demonstrating love. Uh, to people uh, by virtue of having to live through that crisis. I mean, because again, that, at the end of the day, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but the most important thing that you, you did in addition to putting some level of, uh, let, let's call it stability into, into not, re and not real from the crisis, was a demonstration of love and caring and everything you did. And that, that was so important about the kids in inclusiveness for everyone, because one of the things that I learned is everyone could go through the same event, but how they deal with it, they deal with it differently. And I think any time you go through a crisis, and I think we could allude to what we've experienced the past few years with the pandemic, how it really has torn our country apart. Our, you know, I've seen friendships, relationships that have really been shattered because of that and one of the things i knew i knew that road to recovery was going to be difficult but i knew we had to stay together and it started mm -hmm. out with love and caring for each other yeah uh where are we today as as a uh, as a society as it relates to inclusion social justice uh and just the general human condition where, where do you think we are oh, we have areas for improvement i think back 
you know, I grew up during the 60s with, you know, civil unrest and things of that nature, the Vietnam War. And our country was divided, but I don't know if I've ever seen our country so divided right now. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that bothers me most is, you know, we could have differing opinions, but we don't even take time to listen to others to kind of put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And uh, we just block things out. And I think part of that, too, is um, the role social media plays in our lives today. You know, mm -hmm. back when we were growing up, it wasn't there. And you had these discussions. But now with some of the tweets that are going out and all the other social media, it's constant. And I, I, we just really need to come together. And I just wish, I think back to a time in our country, in 9-11, that we, where we came together as Americans and saying, you know, we were attacked by an enemy mm -hmm. and we need to come together as one. And we put aside our political views and both sides across the aisle to come together. And I wish we could get there right now because, you know, one of the things that I worry about is we underestimate the role as adults that we play for our children. And when we see adults acting in the manner they do, it's definitely having an impact on our kids. And that really scares me. Yeah. Why do you think with that? Uh, and again, uh, this is a, this, these are broader these are broader strokes of, of our conversation. But why do you think it's it's continued to be so difficult for people to understand uh, something as fundamental as as a school needs to be a safe place for our children? Why why is that seemingly so difficult for some people to understand? Well, I just see some of the things that are happening within our country. Uh, you know, unfortunately, whenever I get a text that, you know, thinking of you, you're in my thoughts and prayers, there's been something that has happened at a school. And schools are supposed to be the safest place. But mm -hmm. one of the things on a more positive note is people say, well, Frank, you've been speaking for the past 23 years. And, you know, we continue to hear about some of the things that are happening in our schools. But some of the things that we don't hear about is how many have been stopped because of things we're doing differently now, things that were not in place prior to Columbine. Mm -hmm. So we have to build upon that. But, you know, the one thing I think that really resonated with me is someone came to me and said, Frank, what are you going to do? I said, what are we going to do? They're all of our kids. So if something happens here in Colorado or in Florida or in Connecticut, we have to do everything because, you know, one of the things that saddens me is, one of the worst things that you would ever have to do as a parent is lose one of your children. They die before you. Even with my parents, as old as I am, if my parents had to bury me, I'm still their kid. Mm -hmm. And so I think as adults, we want to do everything possible to provide a safe environment for our kids, a learning environment for our kids, a, a childhood which they can look back on and say, yes, this was great. Yeah, 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 well said. Um you know, the other the other thing that I that I I've been thinking a lot about and, and, and talking with folks about is in 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 industry in general. But I but again, my 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 experience, most of my career has been in the construction industry. Uh, but it's but it's just another it's just another industry. Every industry is fundamentally uh, delivers a product or service. You know, people are are the respective industries. Um, you, you can't build a building without people. Uh, you can't run a school without people. You can't run a pharmacy. You can't you can't do anything without people. You can't run a nonprofit, uh, you know, a shelter, and nothing. So people are 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 what it's all about. And so, in in thinking about the younger generation, uh, and and what you know what they're seeing and how they're seeing it, you alluded to when you talked about the impacts of social media. Um, so my question is, what what is our our generation? Uh, doing to try to help the younger generations understand that the fact that you can stand in a room with other people and look around and realize that there's not a, a single other person in that room that is, that is the same as you are. Um, you know, there, even, even if you have Joe and John who are identical twins standing next to each other, they are not the same. So every person is unique in terms of their characteristics their upbringing, the color of their eyes, their body weight, their body, t it just it goes on and on. Their ethnicities, their race, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's our generation doing to, to, to help encourage the younger generation to really embrace that idea 
that j- just because they all look different than me, that's not a problem. That is, it is so valuable. And we've never had this conversation, but you touched upon something uh, that I think really addresses the question that you've asked me. You know, I, being the principal of Columbine, I think a lot of times we look to people that tell us what we want to hear, and it doesn't give you a true evaluation, whether it be your industry, your company, a school, a church, whatever the case may be. And when I became a better principal, because I'd walk down the hall and you'd have those kids saying, you know, we're Columbine, we're rebels, the Columbine rebels, you know, we're blue and silver, we're family. But when I became a better principal, it was such an eye opener for me as when I walked out the doors at Columbine and there were kids that were smoking cigarettes outside that were cutting classes or at the skate park. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, do you even know who we are? And I knew their names. And once I said, you know, what are you doing, Johnny? They said, well, you tell us you care, but there are kids in your school that could care less if we ever walked through those doors again. And it broke my heart. And I said, what I want to do, what I want you to do is you're going to get the kids, your friends that feel this way, and we're going to meet. It's just going to be you and I, and we're going to meet. And I was fair game. It's not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. And they blasted me. And I said, what I need for us to do is you need to come to the next assembly. And they said, why would we come to one of your assembly? You recognize the athletes, you recognize the top students, you recognize the kids that are in the play. Look at me, I got body tats and body piercings. We don't, mm-hmm. and I said, please come to the next. So I had an assembly of about 2,000 kids. And the kids that probably never been to an assembly their entire career at Columbine walk in. And I pulled, I gave each kid a carabiner or a little chain link. And all of a sudden, I was the last to present. And I said, each of you represent a link. Each of you is an individual we, we have different things. That's what makes us so special. Like kind of said, you know, each snowflake is different, but each of you represent a separate link. And I said, you know, some people excel in certain areas, others do not. But I said, what's going to bring us closer together right now is when you take 400 individuals and we'll call you the class of 2017 and you connect. Now, look how strong you are. And now imagine how much stronger we can be as a school. This Columbine family could be when you take 400 links from the class of 2017 and unite them to the class of 16, 15, 14. And I said, we're going to change this environment and we're going to make this a welcoming place for every, every student, every staff member, every parent here. And I put on the song, We Are Family. And I had no idea if it was going to work. But I said, by the time this song is over, we're going to find a way to come together Mm -hmm. at the end 2000 strong the chain is connected and they're chanting we are columbine we are columbine and i said i'm going to put that chain and it still is in the hallways of columbine i said there's going to be days that you struggle you know you may have failed a test you're arguing with the boyfriend girlfriend parents you're always connected to someone Mm -hmm. and something that just resonated and so when i had the seniors graduate i gave them a chain link And I was just recently presenting at a conference and a woman comes up to me and hugs me and starts crying. She said, Mr. D, I don't know how to tell you this, but one of your students just died in an accident. But Columbine was so important to him that when they found him in his body, he had that Columbine link with him. Mm. And that's when I realized a little thing can make a big difference. And that's Mm -hmm. where we all come together. And that's Mm -hmm. the important thing. Yeah. And doesn't that all apply to any setting? I mean, oh. what you just described, that, that's, that could be a, a team on a construction job site. That could be the, fa- the workers on a factory floor in an assembly plant. That could be you know, any environment, any place. That, you know, what you've just described is the, is, the, is the way to give recognition to the fact that differences are, are a good thing. Uh, and can bring a, bring about a, a positive result and strength rather than, than disagreement and dissent. That makes well, sense. I, yes, and Dennis, I did an act a couple of activities that really changed things at Columbine High School, and we had we had teachers and counselors recommend certain students, and it was um, we brought them, and all of a sudden it was a really diverse group. We had kids that were honor students. We had kids that. The chances of them passing school were not very good. But mm-hmm. all of a sudden, we started an event and we had everybody standing on one side of the 
gymnasium floor and they said, how many of you have ever been abused or yelled at by your parents? And all of a sudden, the kids that were 4.0 students were crossing a line with the kids that, you know, were saying, and all of a sudden they're looking at each other saying, I thought I was the only one. We have these preconceptions. And the thing that really got to me is when they said, how many of you during your life have ever thought of hurting yourself? And all of a sudden, these kids walked in. There was no way they're saying, what are we doing here with them? Now Mm -hmm. they're hugging each other saying, gosh, we are in all this together. And I think that's the important thing, just making people realize that we have so many similarities that we need to build upon. And the differences, we can't look at differences as a negative thing. We build upon it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned it earlier and you just alluded to it, and that is that we are we are in the midst of a crisis uh, that is ongoing uh, related to mental health, addiction and suicide. We're, we're, we're deep into it. And as recently as yesterday, another article came out about uh, about uh, the idea of beginning to try to uh, assess anxiety in children as, as early as eight years old. And so, so there's there's so much going on in, in that part. I had an earlier conversation with someone who's an education or, or academic director for a trade school, one of the union trade schools, and one of the things that's a, a pillar of of their approach to dealing with their students, their apprentices, is to, is to deal with their behavioral health, uh, to recognize the fact that what in whatever setting, uh, at whatever level, at whatever age, and now as early as eight years old, you know, individuals are suffering from things like mental health issues, uh, addiction, uh, and in some cases, dying by suicide. Um, it's, it's, it's an ongoing crisis, and it's a crisis that just screams that we need to embrace things like understanding, empathy, tolerance, and certainly love. I couldn't agree more. And I hope as a society, we never get to the point, and we've, you know, we've talked about situations like Columbine, I never want to get to a point in our country where all of a sudden it happens, say, okay, how many this time? And we Mm -hmm. just accept that. We can't. We cannot. We owe it to our kids. We owe it to the next generation. And we can't ever give up hope. And I I refuse. You know, I'm not. And I agree with you 100%. I was at a conference and you think of suicide uh, increasing amongst teenagers. But when I heard the stat on elementary school, that just kind of blew me away. I'm saying, how did we get to this point? Mm -hmm. And what can we do to correct it? Yeah. And in the industry that I spent a lot of my career in, in construction, uh, we have the highest rate of suicide of any industry in America. Uh, and we have the highest rate of addiction as well. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an absolute crisis. And in part, it, 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 can't, it can't be resolved because people don't embrace the notion of understanding self uh, as the foundation for being able to understand others. Well, and Dennis, I'll tell you, I remember right after Columbine, and, and this was 20 plus years ago, there was a stigmatism about counseling and mental health. And, you know, in people, there were people saying, well, if you talk to a counselor, that's a sign of weakness and you're never going to be able to leave that school. Yeah. And luckily I was stubborn and I didn't listen, but I got a phone call within 24 hours from a Vietnam veteran and my mom worked for him. He was a doctor and he said, Frank, I was a Vietnam veteran. I never got the help I needed. Mm-hmm. And it I cost me professionally, personally. And he said, you're going to be pulled in so many different directions that if you don't help yourself, you can't help others. And so that counseling piece is so important. And I know a lot of times when I get to share my story with there's certain organizations like firefighters and police officers that feel we got to be strong for everyone else. But at the same time, it, it's not by coincidence that there's a higher rate of suicide amongst police officers or alcoholism because they feel they have to be strong for everyone else, but they also yeah. need to make sure they're strong enough for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, everything that I, that I talk about and everything that I'm interested in, again, it all relates to the same thing that you're interested in. And is that is the, that is, you know, the, the, the good and welfare for people 
people in their lives, uh, being able to understand themselves, understand others, and be able to build lives, which means relationships. And again, you've heard me talk many times, and it's and it's all throughout my book that the you know the reason soft skills that a person's qualities, the good things about them, are so important for them to understand and be able to use, is that that is that 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 is how you successfully build relationships. Uh, and the relationships are the foundation for success in whatever enterprise you pursue, whether you're a teacher, an accountant, a construction worker, whatever it is, and also, you know, provides you the opportunity to perhaps have a happier life. I, I couldn't agree more. And I just hope with our kids, and I was so proud of my parents. Uh, we were doing a family dinner. It was a holiday dinner. And one of the things they had the grandkids do and nieces and nephews do, put their phones in a basket. Mm -hmm. Because when we sat around the table, we were actually going to talk. And one of the things that just drives my wife and I crazy is we'll be out to dinner and we'll see, you know, a couple together and they're probably on a date or something. And they're both, they're just sitting mm -hmm. there texting, you know, and I'm yeah. saying, gosh, what, what happened to us? Why can't we carry on a conversation like you and I are doing right now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, my girlfriend, I, you know, if, when, when we're having a meal, uh, it's just, and in part, it's probably cultural, but but there is no talking. We eat, and then yeah. we get finished <laughs> uh, finish eating, then we talk. Right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but the whole idea is, um, uh, and this is really you know the the um, the impetus and the and the motivation for me to try to carry this message and to to do it in this way to to build on the summit is that is that love, inclusion, social justice, and leadership. If you just focus on on working in those four areas, um, our life, our world will be a better place. I couldn't agree with you more, and that's why when we connected, I said, "Oh my gosh, you nailed it!" I mean, it's just fantastic, and uh, we believe in it. And I think the important thing is a lot of times um, we feel that if you're involved in certain occupations, like you talked about the steel industry, I'm an educator. But there's things that are similar that bring us all together. It doesn't matter what you do. And you're talking about it. It's love. It's about relationships. That it doesn't matter. They transfer over. And that's what's going to make the world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good sentence to end with. Our time, it's, it's amazing. We've, uh, this conversation seems like it went like that. And there's, there's, there's really fundamentally one reason for that is that we started this conversation with shared values. Um, you know, we believe a lot of the same things. We come from entirely different places, but if you want to, sh you want to talk about the idea of differences and how differences are not a bad thing, you can look at this, you know, this, this Irish Catholic and you can look at this Italian Catholic <laughs> and, uh, and for the, and for the for the benefit of of my audience is who's listening, when I laughed so so loudly earlier when Frank when Frank talked about uh, about uh, penmanship in uh, in elementary school, when he was when we were on the summit together, uh, I mentioned talking about my background that I, somehow I missed penmanship, uh, <laughs> and uh, and Frank then signed himself as Catholics do, uh, and I made some comment about that which I was later called out for, uh, but uh, and, and deservedly so. I didn't realize I was among such a large group of Catholics uh, oh. in that uh, with the penmanship thing. But but my printing is very good, Frank. I didn't get to mention that then, but I'll mention it. I'll mention it now. Um, I appreciate you. I respect you. Uh, I have love for you. I you know there's a reason why we met uh, those months ago in, at Steve Farber's event, and I got to hear you for the first time there, and you got to hear a little bit of me as well. Uh, you were wonderful in the summit. This has been a, a great use of time. And uh, I know that the people that listen to our conversation will consider it to be a gift. Well, and I'm truly blessed. You know, we met and I'll still remember it was leap year. It was uh, 2020. Right. Uh, we were there for, we had February 29th, then it was leap year. And then right after that, uh, our lives changed quite a bit uh, yeah. for the next couple yeah. of years. But meeting you was a true blessing. And I have so much admiration and love and respect for you. And, uh, you know, we're never going to give up. No, because, we're not. Uh, we're going we're to make a difference. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Soft as Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. 
To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast with Dennis Duran. 